Good morning. I'm George Trieste. I'm the director of the State Performance Plan Technical Assistance Project, better known as SBP TAP. This project is run out of the Napa County Office of Education, funded by the California Department of Education Special Education Division. Welcome. I'd like to introduce Connie Silver Broussard, our technical assistance coordinator, who will take it from here. Connie. Thank you, George. So I have a few reminders uh, for this morning. Um, before we begin today, I want to quickly remind you that we're being recorded. So if you experience any technical difficulties, you will have an opportunity to view this webinar um, at a later date. Okay. Uh, second, we will be sending out a very brief evaluation survey following this webinar. And that will come to you via email, so keep an eye out for that. And as with past webinars, we've muted your telephone lines. So if you have a question for today's presenter, please use the chat feature that you've used in the past. And if for some reason chat isn't working for you or you're not on um, the web with us and listening just via the phone, feel free to email your questions to George. Let me give you his email address. That's g-e-o-r-g-e -E dot t-r-i-e-s-t at s-p-p-t-a-p -P -P dot o-r-g. And we'll make sure we get an answer to you um, during the session today, okay? So lastly, you will be asked to participate in a couple polls. And as you remember, when we transition from the slide view to a poll, your screen will change. So just uh, remember that it will look different for a moment. Okay, so we are going to get started. And first thing I'm going to do is introduce you to our speaker today, and that's Mr. Daniel Lawson. So Daniel Lawson is a senior education policy, sorry, law and policy associate with the Civil Rights Project at the University of California, Los Angeles, and formerly a lecturer on law at Harvard Law School. He has authored numerous publications, including the book Racial Inequity in Special Education, and regularly provides guidance to policymakers, educators, and advocates regarding the impact of law and policy on children of color and language minority students. Working under contract with the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, Mr. Lowson develops the annotated checklist for addressing racial disproportionality in special education. And this assessment tool is the focus of Mr. Lowson's presentation today. Before becoming a specialist in education, law, and policy, Mr. Lowson taught in public schools in Massachusetts for 10 years and also helped found an alternative public school in Acton, Massachusetts. So with that, I'm going to pass it now to Daniel Lowson. Thank you uh, to all of you on the line and to the, to the State of California Department of uh, Special Education for inviting me to participate in this. And hopefully uh, what I present today will support you in your work with the districts. I um, like to begin oftentimes with just saying a little bit more about myself. Um, my experience with this issue in particular my first experience uh, was before I became a lawyer or a researcher in this area, I was uh, teaching in a district outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I was a second year teacher. Uh, the district I taught in had about a third of the students who were from Boston. Uh, one uh, of the black male students I was teaching second grade, in, one of the black males in particular was a real handful. Uh, he had all sorts of behavioral issues, learning issues. Uh, one example is on more than one occasion, uh, he pulled down his pants for the whole class and wiggled his weenie. Um, there were other kinds of issues that came up. Uh, he had very difficult time learning. But all in all, I never actually thought this student was a student with mental retardation. He was very uh, gifted athletically. He showed game smarts when he played out in recess. He also um, was a very good singer, uh, dancer, um, and had uh, real charm uh, and sort of real sort of some in some strange in some ways very good social skills in some ways very poor social skills. Um, at towards the end of my second year, I had received a lot of support as a second year teacher in classroom management and improved dramatically in that area, and with that also was able to help the student uh, and the classroom deal with his behavior a lot better. But I was also told towards the end of this year that he was going to be uh, 
reevaluated. And apparently we were going to wait for his IQ score to come back. And had his IQ score came back below, I think it was 80, uh, I was told he would have to go back to Boston. Uh, he had brothers and sisters in this district, but he would have to leave Boston, leave this district to go back to Boston because this district didn't have the special ed support services to be needed because if he came back with a lower IQ score, he would have to be put in a more restrictive setting. And I have to say that despite feeling that the student didn't have mental retardation and was actually, as I became a better classroom manager, was becoming more and more successful, I am certain that, one, I didn't even think about a racial issue, and two, I would have just deferred to the experts and the evaluators and said, okay, I knew he was a very difficult student to deal with and it was draining and, and part of me was thinking, well, it will be a lot easier for next year's teacher if the student isn't there. But at the same time, I knew, and I would say the other special educators knew that the student was not a student with mental retardation and probably would have done just fine staying in the district. Well, the long and short of the story is that he did uh, in this case, they have the district, but it, I reflect on that in that it just reveals how easy it is that these decisions that are made about students um, can be made and it's not necessarily in their best interest, that there could be inappropriate identification, and that there are a lot of different factors that contribute to this. And part of the reason that um, we developed this checklist in three parts, uh, which comes in three parts, is that every district is different. The questions on the checklist are designed to help districts to probe into the, the variety of factors that, uh, that research suggests are, are, are possible causal, have possible causal relationships. There are also legal requirements that inform the items on the checklist. Uh, they're refined by use in Wisconsin, uh, so experience working with a checklist with districts, and have since used this checklist with other districts in, in other states, including in California. There are also, um, it's important to realize that the, the, uh, the structure of the checklist really helps, is meant to help to get at the multiple causes of disproportionality and hopefully to steer uh, schools and districts to thinking about what it is they can do and not just think about um, this issue as one of um, merely finding out you know, where they're out of compliance with IDEA or some other law, but really thinking deeper about uh, their experience with kids. So there are three parts, as I mentioned. There's the first part looks at um, resources. The second checklist uh, looks at system policy practice and procedural issues. The third at environmental factors, mostly factors outside the district. Uh, the checklist is meant to help the district both formulate hypotheses and also as they're using it, suggest remedies, and I can give an example of, of how that um, uh, how that has happened uh, in a minute. Um, there, are, I, I always stress that there there are lots of different questions on the checklist because there really are multiple responses. The research really points to that there are multiple interconnected causes for racial disproportionality and racial differences in the placement of students and the discipline of students with disabilities. So finding just one cause is unlikely. The idea is that there are several hypotheses that a district could, could form. Uh, and we, I, I, hope, I hope that in using this checklist, districts will find some um, causes that, or potential causes that they can actually do some work on. So I can't stress enough, and this is my, uh, my son Sam, when he was a bit younger, at the Exploratorium, by the way. Uh, but I can't uh, support enough the idea that as you work with districts, that you want to encourage them to not sort of try to necessarily isolate individual factors, but actually just to help them see that there are multiple factors and know that they are entangled and really focus in on the ones that they can have some impact on. Uh, and for this reason, I also, when I work with districts, actually before, I, I often send the, they use the, the checklist either before I get there or with but I also um, do a lot of work with data around the checklist. And the data, I analyze the district's data, I help them broaden the inquiry, 
uh, try to find what is working well in the district that's related to the issues uh, they've been identified for. I try to simplify the measures so that they can use the data themselves. Uh, when I leave, I hope the district has the capacity to use and track data and look at trends over time. I also use the data in working with the districts to debunk uh, many of the excuses that I that uh, are presented with and to track progress and then eventually to evaluate interventions that they, that they select. And I should mention we are now on uh, slide 11 and moving to slide 12. And so I'm going to focus the next set of comments on checklist one, which is about resources. Um, the, the story that I like to uh, tell folks about is I was working with a district, a large district in Wisconsin, and they were looking at the checklist and going around. And one of the things that they they discovered was that um, there was a Title I director there, a number of special educators, um, and they realized that the and and, the, and there wasn't a behavioral specialist, but there was a school psychologist. And they, they realized that a lot of times the uh, Title I teacher was getting all kinds of calls from the new teachers about uh, what to do about this behavior or that behavior. And she said, you know, I tell them as much as I can do, but we actually, she pointed out, we have a behavioral support person in a district. So that came up in the course of using a checklist as a possible uh, contributor to the racial disproportionality, but also I, in the conversation, they realized that they may actually have a remedy there, right there on hand. So um, it, it's really important uh, in all the checklists, but um, to to have special educators and general educators at the same table when they do review the checklist. So if that can happen, I certainly would re recommend that happen. Uh, one of the checklist areas and resources that I like to concentrate on, and you'll see that the questions are, do cover this in detail, are thinking about teachers as resource, resources. And that's uh, because the research does suggest that teachers that are poorly trained, um, teachers that are inexperienced, uh, new to the field, might tend to refer kids for special education more often. The IDEA has, and we'll go over this in a little bit more detail, has some uh, requirements to, to rule out ineffective instruction as a predominant factor. And Title I also is, reflects a concern that especially poor and minority students are more likely to have teachers that are inexperienced or out of field. Um, so I'm going to switch now to the polling. And we're going to uh, do a poll around this topic. So here we go. And so the first question, and you'll be able, you should be able to vote now as soon as I open this. The pro, that's the wrong one. Close voting. This one, open voting. Okay. So the first question is, do inexperienced or poorly trained teachers, in your opinion, refer more students to be evaluated uh, for special education? Okay, so I will now move. I'm going to address three polls at once. I'm going to close the voting on on that issue. I'm going to try to record your responses. Uh, let's see. And then close this. Close the voting. Go to the next poll. Open the voting. And so the next question is, do districts think about whether the least experienced and qualified teachers tend to be placed with classrooms or in schools with higher numbers of poor and minority students. And then I'm going to close the voting there. This is the last poll. And this question is, do districts consider the support provided to less experienced teachers
So I'm going to close the voting, and now I'm going to revert back to the the shared document. Go. So uh, in the first question, nine to one. Uh, so I may have closed the voting too soon. I apologize. Uh, but nine to one, people said yes. Uh, they do think that inexperienced or poorly trained teachers refer students for evaluations more often. The uh, second question, uh, the results were six said yes and seven said no to this question, so fairly evenly divided as to whether districts think about this issue um, and whether or not poor minority students are exposed to less qualified or inexperienced teachers. And then to the third question, um, the answer was overwhelmingly that uh, do they consider the support provided to less, less experienced teachers? I had 12, I believe 12 no's, or maybe it was, was it 12 yeses or 12 no's? Can someone tell me who saw the, uh, I don't want to go all the way back to my poll results. But there were 12 no's to that. Um, and so the, so the research certainly does, uh, the research from the National Research Council, the research that we've done does suggest that uh, the inexperience of teachers, the lack of training contributes to this in sort of a benign way that many times uh, teachers will express uh, the idea that they don't know what to do with a student, but at least if the student was getting special education services, that someone would be able to help that student. Um, so the reason I, I focus on this question is because I think it's a really important one based on the sort of general consensus in the research that this is likely a contributing factor, but also because in the areas that most districts are being identified as having overrepresentation, and these are kids who enter the mainstream and then are referred, usually by a classroom teacher or by a parent, but usually something or, or administrator, I guess, but oftentimes it's the classroom teacher making this referral. Um, so it's, it's really important, I think. It's also an area that, that school districts have control over. So to the extent that this may be going on in a district uh, you, are, you are working with, um, it, it's really, I think, important. Uh, and, and, and to the extent that, you'll, that districts are going to be required to use 15% of their Part B special ed funds for coordinated early intervening services, one of the acceptable uses of those funds is training for teachers. Um, so it also is an issue that it's not squarely about compliance or non-compliance with the IDEA because it so much has to do with what's going on in general education. Um, and so I encourage that it, whether or not this is a, an area that a district decides is a causal factor and something they want to work on, but in general, that in looking at the use of the 15 percent, uh, that it is that there's some real conscious attempt to both look at prevention, look at general education, and think about whether the, the, the group, the racial subgroup that triggered the expenditure will benefit from, from the intervention. Um, I think I went over the, the, this research. Um, I also um, think it's important, though, to see the connections uh, between identification, placement, and discipline. And more and more now, school districts will be uh, required to look at racial disparities and discipline data. Um, and you can see how these things might go hand in hand. Uh, for example, if uh, a student, if a student uh, with emotional disturbance um, is more likely to be removed entirely from the classroom after they're identified. That might be a, 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 a sort of a, a motivating factor for a young or new teacher, knowing that if I refer the student, there's a chance that I won't have to actually work with that student so much anymore. Um, now I would like to pause for about 30 seconds to see if you have questions. So I'm looking at the chat area. Uh, and uh, so please make sure that you or write your questions in the chat box and then press, I guess, return or enter. Um, and then I will try to answer any questions before moving on to the, the next part because we're about to move into 
uh, discussion of checklist two. And we are now on about to, we're on slide uh, 20. So one question from Guillermo uh, was whether or not um, the research that I'm talking about, whether there's a correlation to dropout rates and to most, especially with regard to ELD status. And I would say that if you can get uh, the district to provide you some data on either dropouts or I prefer to use graduation rate uh, data, but that's the subject of another webinar. Uh, but that's an area I have some expertise in as well. Um, and to look at relationships, I try to not do the official, uh, you know, uh, data analysis that looks at uh, correlates in a formal way, and I'll, and I'll describe uh, some informal ways to, to look at these relationships. But the, the answer is yes, and working with the district under data, I, look, I like to get achievement data, graduation rate data, other kinds of data, and, and to look to see whether there are consistent trends and patterns, and there's a lot of good reasons to do that. Um, I'm going to now move on to uh, checklist two. Um, and you'll see that as we move on, uh, there are many of the issues under checklist two um, that, uh, <laughs> that um, are related to resources but could be framed in another way. So checklist two is focused on system policies, practices, and procedures. I encourage districts uh, to look at all their policies, to consider things like tracking. Uh, obviously, inclusion would be an important one, uh, and but also the expectations around inclusion. I've taught in districts where, you know, because I was, uh, you know, more amenable to inclusion, I wound up with more students with disabilities. So there was always questions as a matter of policy whether or not it was an expectation that teachers are trained to work in an inclusive model, um, whether or not response to intervention is going on, whether there's time for collaboration. As you can imagine, time for collaboration could be thought of as a resource in terms of time for teachers to work together, but also a policy in whether or not scheduling of teachers and their breaks and, and staff development is is organized in a way as a matter of policy to ensure that special ed and general ed teachers are having those sorts of opportunities. Um, so to focus in on uh, practices, um, one is one thing to, to delve into is whether there are incentives. Uh, I mentioned the example of the student with uh, emotional disturbance, the incentives to remove the student. Uh, are there um, test accountability incentives, all the pressure to raise test scores, uh, as, and this may be something even more on the horizon where there's value-added measures. Would there be pressure to identify more kids, especially in the course of a given year, as having a disability? Because then the question may arise whether or not that student's test scores should be attributed or should be treated differently than another student in terms of evaluating that teacher or that school. Right now, we do have school-level accountability. Um, the issue of unconscious bias is one that I'm going to um, delve into in more detail. And there are resource incentives that, that um, affect practices. For example, the uh, decision in some cases not to provide a student who may have mild disabilities with a 504 plan. 504 plan re requires, it comes out of anti-discrimination law, requires uh, that students get reasonable accommodations, often, often get support services in the, in the, you know, through school counselors uh, and that sort of support, but not, do not have an IEP. But in some cases, states may only get funding from the federal government if the student is eligible under the IDEA, and so there may be an incentive to identify more students and have them have an IEP. So those are some ways that resources and practices also can overlap. and. The, the checklist uh, does at least pose these questions, encourages districts to look at some of these issues. Uh, procedures, uh, you know, the example from Madison 
uh, from uh, the district in Wisconsin. Actually, it wasn't it wasn't Madison. Um, uh, but anyhow, uh, are, are there procedures for teachers to ask for help? How is uh, RTI being implemented? Um, and then there's procedures with regard to when a student's a, a refer for an evaluation. Is there a consideration of classroom ecology? Um, and by classroom ecology, uh, in the IDEA, there's a requirement that um, uh, ineffective reading and math instruction be ruled out as a predominant factor in identifying a student as having a disability. Now, these may be uncomfortable conversations and uncom uncomfortable inquiries, but it is a requirement of the IDEA. So there are, in the checklist you'll see in the end notes, there are um, all, all the relevant uh, statutory requirements and some of the re regulatory ones are there in part to help uh, superintendents and other administrators um, delve into these difficult questions. Um, there's also full sites to relevant research um, to support a lot of the inquiries, some of which may not be the most comfortable but are important to do. And where you should be, this is slide 25. And so moving on, um, school suspensions actually is an area that looks at policy, practice, and procedure. So as policy, you can imagine a zero tolerance policy, they're requiring students to be suspended for cell phone use. As a practice, you may see that some teachers and some schools within a district are suspending far more students than other schools uh, or other teachers within a school or other, other schools within the district. And there may be procedural issues, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, the other important reason I always encourage uh, uh, districts I work with to look at their discipline data is that because I, the research does suggest that there's a link, there's a possible link between identification issues and restricted placement and school discipline. So, you know, one of the questions I always press districts on is whether they've looked at the disaggregated data or students with disabilities in the area of discipline. So that's where um, the calculations, uh, this is an example of uh, calculations I often do before uh, I, I join with the district. So I'm going to walk you through as an example of how I encourage uh, districts to look at some of their discipline data and look at this discipline data over time. So, and this kind of trend analysis could be applied to any area, it wouldn't have to be discipline. Um, and it's important that uh, I know you in another webinar you went over how risk is calculated. So in working with a district, I would be certain to review how to calculate risk for any category, whether it be discipline or any other category, by dividing the number of students in the racial group by in, the, in a given category by their total enrollment in the district or if I'm doing it at the school level at the school level. Then multiply that by 100 and that gets the risk for that. And then so you would have the risk for each of the different racial groups, and you can compare them. You don't have to do the comparison to all other groups, because in working with the district, I find it much simpler and makes a lot more sense to just do each racial group separately and look at those uh, and do the analysis comparing to whites or Asian Americans or whatever group, but not to use all other, and that, that gets into a whole set of additional calculations. Um, so the next slide. It uh, shows how uh, I've already done these calculations, but working with the district, I would have had them calculate the black, the students with disabilities. What is their risk of being uh, suspended? And, and so this is out-of-school suspension risk over here. And this is for blacks and for whites. And then looking across all these different years, okay? And then, um, so I have done these calculations, but normally I would have the district do the, do the calculations of the black risk for suspension, the white risk for suspension, and then do the additional calculations. What is the risk difference, and what is the risk ratio? The risk difference is just a subtract, simple subtraction, black risk minus, you know, take the group that has the highest risk and subtract the one of the groups that has a lower risk and look at the risk difference. Um, and then calculate the risk ratio, comparing, you know, two of the more predominant uh, racial groups in the district. And you can compare Latin, uh, Latinos with Asian Americans. This uh, enables you to compare any two groups uh, that you would like to do. 
And then you come up with a, a risk ratio simply by dividing this 9 by 3, and in this case 10 by 5, and so forth. Um, and that gives you the, the, the risk ratio. And having them do those calculations I find is, is really useful. And then the next step, and usually I would do this working with uh, a superintendent first before I present it to the, the district staff. Um, but um, it's to think about these trends over time and what directions. And, and it's really important to point out that I also would look at other, it wouldn't just be looking at suspensions. I'd be looking at several different factors. And also, as I do this, looking for some positive trends, uh, not just negative trends. Uh, you will find that um, there are many ways to interpret the same data set. And based on, you know, if you look at the, uh, the table and you have that out in front of you, uh, which is the first page in the calculation handout, you'll see that risk ratio, uh, you, you know, here are three questions. This was originally going to be a poll, but I'm just going to walk you through it. So has risk ratio, uh, risk ratio has gone dramatically down since 2004. And that, so that's one possible interpretation. You could say uh, suspension risk has gone up more dramatically for whites than blacks since 2004. Um, the black-white discipline gap has nearly doubled in six years. And now there's an extraordinarily high risk for black students with disabilities to be suspended, or all the above. So the tendency for districts oftentimes is to just take one narrative, usually the one that's most favorable. Um, and it's important to, hold, you know, to steer them away from looking at just one cut at the data. And this is another reason that I also suggest looking at the data, but also looking at several slices of the same data and looking at, at that over time. So it's true that the risk ratio went down from a risk ratio, if you're just looking at black, blacks and whites, from 3.0 to 2.2. So that looks like uh, uh, an important um, uh, change. And I would acknowledge that it is important. Uh, but I'd also say that we should consider the fact that one in five blacks were suspended back in 2000, uh, are now suspended. And it had only been one in 11 blacks in 2004 which is what the frequency for whites is now, uh, and point out that just looking at the risk ratio alone can mask the depth of a real problem and its growth. And this is also gets to, you know, beyond the mere compliance uh, and really digging in and looking at problem solving. It's also true you could look at the same data set and said the white risk went up three times the 2004 rate when they gained six percentage points. And that was a larger percentage increase than for blacks, which only went up 2.2 times the 2004 rate, and which is also true. But, but it's really important to point out that blacks gained five percentage points more than whites in the same period. So the, the sort of looking at percent growth over time can also mask uh, you know, what it is that, that is being discussed and, 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 and and it's really important, I guess, to get to this last issue, which is that blacks with disabilities now are experiencing, and I would call this an extraordinarily high risk for disciplinary exclusion, and that it's doubled in it at what it was in 2004. So I feel that C most accurately describes uh, the trend um, in the data, and that if we had just looked at the risk ratio, you would miss that. Or if you just looked at the percentage change over time, you would also miss that. Uh, one of the things that I have, I actually have districts uh, use their data and fill in uh, charts, uh, and so they use markers, and, and I, I'll present a blank chart in, in sort of a workbook exercise. And because it, I feel it really, one, working with their own data really helps them understand the issue, but also avoid these kinds of problems where there's a, maybe a preference to describe it in one way or another that's more favorable to the district, where if you look at this, this is a chart of all the data that's in your table. And you can see that here, yes, there's a, this is a risk ratio of 3.0. There's a six-point difference. And here, there's an 11-point difference. The risk ratio is lower than it was here. But this gap is huge and involves far more black students than here, uh, than, than in 2004. So, and if you think about a trend line, I mean, the, the trend is really a much steeper uh, change than than what than what's experience what is going on. It's, it's, excuse my floppy handwriting, but 
But the, the, the point is, when they actually use their own data, calculate this themselves, and plot it themselves on a graph, these points are driven home, and they'll leave your work with them being able to do this themselves. And it's presented looking at risk and risk difference is a very powerful way to drive the, the issue home in hopes that, um, you know, folks will really own this issue. And so, uh, which brings me to this issue, an overriding issue that I have in working with districts. This is my son, Sam. And he came back from his first day of kindergarten once and said, Daddy, today I learned the Pledge of Illusions. So I always say, I use that now, and I say, we need not to let, we make sure that no one is taking this Pledge of Illusions uh, because it ends with liberty and justice for none. And the empirical data really helps. But other data also helps get beyond the sort of sense to avoid the problem some way or another. So one of the issues I always bring up in working with districts is um, um, implicit bias, uh, which is uh, fairly well established by neurological scientists from Yale and Harvard. And they look at um, the, uh, some, they develop something called the Implicit Attitude Test, the IAT, that helps reveal uh, unconscious bias. And there are many tests, uh, and I'll give you the website where you can actually explore this for yourself, but you can look at gender, you can look at age, all sorts of kinds of ways to do this. And it's done using sort of neurological impulses and word associations or face and word associations. Um, it's also true that when, we, when scientists have looked at implicit and explicit racial bias, um, they find that both whites and blacks have implicit bias that is more favorable to whites than to blacks, even though they may very differ about explicit racial bias, if any at all is detected. Um, and this gets to back to the, there's a, there's a general, uh, I know Russ Kiva's pointed out and others, and I experienced this at the district level, there's a certain reluctance to really look at the racial data on a regular basis, and I think part of it is, is, is underneath this, is this uh, uncomfortability with looking or considering that bias, uh, racial bias of any sort may be part of what's going on. What I often do is I talk about my own experience, and um, when I was being trained to be a teacher, it was well known in, in terms of empirical data that girls tended to, around fourth and fifth grade, stop being high performers in math and science. So we did a lot of videotaping in my classroom. We did this with all the teachers, men and women. I was the only male teacher in my elementary school. But I didn't say, oh, I'm not a male chauvinist. Don't do this. You know, could, it must be something else. Um, there wasn't this reluctance. So I think we need to, to look at the racial differences and a lot of the trends that we're seeing and think of it in, in terms of the, the contribution of an overall societal bias in a way that, same way that we would consider that there might be gender bias or something about how we do our and deliver instruction around math and science that may be contributing to this sudden change in girls' attitudes about math and science and their performance. Um, and this brings up the I issue of cognitive dissonance. In other words, if something is really too difficult to, to think about, then you find other reasons. You avoid, you avoid it. So uh, another reason I encourage folks to look at implicit bias is because it's really important to look at their racial data, uh, not to just try to find one single factor. It gets you out of the whole uh, individual, you know, that, that there's one problem or an issue of noncompliance. We just fix that and we'll be, uh, you know, out, out, of the, out of the hole, so to speak. So. You know, if we can't address this possibility, it's, it's less likely we'll really use all the evidence that are at our disposal. And, um, um, you know, what we pay attention to and what districts pay attention to is they formulate hypotheses and decide how to use that 15 percent and whether or not they track whether it's working for the racial group that triggers it, is, you know, is really important. Um, so here's a place where you can test yourself and explore this, and I certainly would not recommend ra you know, uh, raising this specifically in terms of this research without having done this yourself. And I often will offer my own ratings. And here I am both a civil rights advocate, someone who does research in this area and working on policy uh, in this area. <clears throat> and 
you know, twice when I took this test, I had I came out as having a slightly negative attitude towards blacks. Once there was no bias whatsoever, and once I had actually pro-black bias. And I, before I took the test that time, I I decided I would take about five or ten minutes to think about all 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 my heroes. Uh, I'm a jazz musician as well as uh, someone who does work in civil rights. So I thought about you know Martin Luther King and John Coltrane. And after thinking about that for about five minutes and having all these positive associations and so forth in my mind, and then I took the test, um, it affected my, my outcomes. And there is other research to suggest that that, that would be the case. So, um, so it's really important to, to bring that up. But it's also true that sometimes noncompliance is an issue, and it's often the big stick, something that uh, that folks uh, districts at the district level want to avoid. Uh, on the one hand, so sometimes they, that's what they're looking for. Sometimes they don't want you to talk about possible noncompliance. And, but discipline is an area in special education, especially with looking at long-term suspensions uh, of over 10 days, can be found to have a link to procedural noncompliance. And um, I should mention again that the, the checklist does uh, contain all the legal requirements in the end notes uh, that are associated with this in terms of the procedural requirements. So in terms of this is my son Lenny <laughs> at Yosemite. Uh, so in terms of thinking about uh, the sticks, some folks can think about uh, this requirement that we spend 15% of our Part B funds and coordinated early intervening services as a stick. And others may think of it as, uh, as a, a carrot of sorts if you can have that money spent in a way that really, really works. It works for kids, uh, reduces uh, disproportionality, me meaning that it's reducing uh, students who are inappropriately identified. It can be sort of a, a, a real effective tool uh, for, for addressing this issue and having the flexibility of those funds. But back to the uh, discipline issue, one of the things that uh, research suggests is that sometimes in terms of procedural, Sometimes uh, principals don't even aren't even aware of the law. So this is this slide is based on a study in Delaware. Only about half the principals knew that students with disabilities had additional due process rights when they were going to be suspended for more than ten days. And there's a requirement that there's a manifestation determination. Oftentimes, if there's no advocate at the table, the issue is just focused on whether or not the student's behavior was caused by the disability. And usually that the determination, well, it's not, it's not enough to blame uh, to excuse the student. What often not addressed is whether or not there was a failure to properly implement the student's IEP, which is also an um, important uh, consideration. And, and to think about whether or not behavioral assessments are being provided, are they being redone on a regular basis, was there a behavioral improvement plan in place at the time, just on those sorts of procedural issues. So we're about ready to move on to the third um, checklist. And if you have uh, chats, um, uh, if you have questions, now is the time. I'll provide about 30 seconds to write in a question if you have one. And we are in slide 45. So looking at checklist three uh, concerns itself with environmental factors, and it raises the question of who is responsible, what's the remedy. Um, and I always point out that um, that uh, even when there's a causal factor uh, that may be contributing, that there are usually things that schools can do, and I'll give you an example of that. Uh, just going back for a second to the chat, uh, I see there was a question. The lack of uh, 
Guillermo asks, the lack of pertinent data that could be collected, how to get it looked at? So one of the things, uh, just to answer that question before moving into this, and it's relevant to this inquiry as well, is that I always talk to the, the superintendent or the special ed director and try to identify who their data person is and ask them for their, their data, not just the data they provide to the state that contributed to the fact that they were identified, but I ask for several different kinds of data and establish a relationship with that data person and explain that what I do is work with the data as well as the checklist when working with them to help them have a sort of deeper and, and broader inquiry uh, using the checklist. And, and, and so far, um, there hasn't been an issue, uh, well, that's actually not true. There was one district where the, the data person originally said, oh, they'll provide me with all the data I wanted, no problem. Push came to shove, I kept asking for it, and they said, well, I don't think this is an important issue, so I'm not gonna, I, I don't have time for this. I'm not gonna provide the data, even though the superintendent and the special ed director had asked her to do this. So I had to use all the data they had supplied to the state. Um, and so there was there was limited to how much I, I could do with that district. Um, there have been a lot of changes in, in that district, um, and in fact, this data person is no longer there, so, <laughs> but that didn't help me at the time in terms of working with the district. So occasionally there can be some pushback around the data. Hopefully there isn't that, you won't experience that, uh, not experience that in a district in California. Um, so moving on to checklist three, um, you know, a lot of these questions sort of get at the, the sort of general question. It's a sort of blaming game. Whose fault is it? And this is Lenny in the back and Sam in front, and that is actually Alcatraz in the background. Um, and hopefully at this point, the reason, and one of the reasons that this is the third checklist in the series is that I, and, and this is true when I work with districts, I try not to bring this up first because it can take up a lot of time and become very draining and, and then you never really get into the real issues of, of what are the, some of the factors that school districts might be, uh, it, what, what are some of the ways that school districts might actually be contributing to the phenomenon. So, um, so it's really important to try uh, to not dwell on this issue. On the other hand, these questions always have come up in every district I've worked with. And one of the questions is, or one of the, the statements uh, that is often made is um, that the students were identified before they entered the district. Um, and so, I, you know, I usually ask, you know, have you run the numbers? Is there really a net gain? Um, and I'll point out to you that in the in the end notes, there's a presentation, there's a link to a presentation, hopefully it's still a live link, by Jack Jorgensen uh, from uh, Madison, Wisconsin, where they did run the numbers and, in fact, uh, in a, a very elaborate uh, analysis and found it made, made a tiny bit of difference. But their conclusion was, yes, it, it made a difference, but it was very, very small. And um, so I encourage... Uh, whenever these issues come up, that we really ask some of the, the hard questions. Another one that comes up sometimes is it really requires sort of a, a pushback. So if they're saying, oh, they think it's a lead exposure issue, well, um, that sh should be explored. And in that, that is one of those examples where I find that I can say the school district, we should really look into this if this is your hypothesis, because there's a lot of things that schools can do with, with regard to screening for lead, public education, education about parents and their, and their homes, but also maybe gathering the information. There may be, uh, you know, some issue of exposure to toxins, for example, that's affecting a subgroup of the population, and the schools can play a role in that. And so that's important for them to think about. Uh, but oftentimes when you do break down the numbers, there is the number, it doesn't wash. The, the, the hypothesis is one that doesn't come close to explaining and one of the ways I talk about, you know, this idea that the kids are being identified somewhere else and there's other districts and they're just attracted to our district because of our good special ed services, is I look at decisions uh, and that are made about kids in the district. So if the district has a gifted and talented pro uh, program, do you see sort of similar disparities where 
fewer black and Latino kids than, say, white and Asian kids are being identified as gifted. Those are decisions made by the district, by district educators. The, the data around suspension. Uh, there can be data around access to AP classes, um, and on and on. So looking at the decisions, labeling and sorting decisions that are made about students within the district uh, often, often helps sort of uh, get the district to move off of, you know, if they're really insistent that they, that's what they think explains it, to, to start thinking more broadly. I'm seeing the connections with their trends in some areas, such as over-identification and other areas as well. The big uh, question that comes up is about poverty, that poverty is a root cause, um, and I always uh, find it really important to address this in a couple ways. One, that poverty does contribute uh, to uh, a higher incidence of disability. Uh, generally, the research would support that. But doesn't, being poor doesn't equal disability. Uh, certainly, if some of the differences were about class bias, that would not be appropriate. And, you know, there is no, um, poverty is not destiny. Um, there are other things like looking at gender differences, uh, nationally looking at black and Hispanics are about equally poor, but there are very different kinds of rates for special education identification in different categories. So, but it's important to use, if they can, to use the district level data to further unpack this, especially if this is coming up a lot. And, you know, I have seen where this is, comes up over and over. So at this point, I'm going to ask you uh, to look at your calculator. Again, it, it, uh, someone pointed out, I think it was um, uh, Guillermo pointed out, that you don't always have this data. But if you can get this free and reduced lunch data, which is a proxy for poverty, uh, you can do additional analysis and sort of unpack this and this issue, uh, and it really, I find when I can do this, it's very, very helpful. And and basically, um, if poverty did explain all the difference, then you would see roughly equal rates among the poor and non-poor of all races uh, for identification. For example, poor blacks and poor whites should be roughly equal. Non-poor blacks and non-poor whites should be roughly equal. Um, so I'm going to now walk you through uh, uh, some of the calculations that I would do, and I would do this with the district, assuming I had access to this data. And basically, you, this, is a, this would be the issue here, would be over-identification and specific learning disabilities. And again, I don't see all other group. Um, and um, it, so I, I look at individual racial groups. It's a much simpler calculation, and there's no problem with doing this on the district level. And do the calculations by, for example, you divide B by A. So the, the students with free and reduced lunch who have students with disabilities who are black divided by the total black students on free and reduced lunch. And the same thing for the white students. And then for the non-poor, these are the students not on free and reduced lunch, do the same calculation. So you'd be dividing B by C. So go ahead and do that, and you will get the risk calculations. And while you do that, I will show you um, what I did, would have done, you know, in terms of looking at the district. And, and, and basically, we have a situation where there were 71 total black students with specific learning disability out of, a, out of 600 and they had 11.83%. That was their risk. And the number of white students was 48 out of a, out of 1,000, so their risk was 4.8. The difference was 7.03, the risk ratio for this district. This was a, without uh, analyzing for poverty was 2.47. So what I'm asking you to do with the district, if you can, is to look at, to further break this down. And so, uh, this is what, hopefully you've done your calculations, and this is what you should have come up with, a 12% risk for the poor blacks with specific learning disabilities, 12% of their total population of poor students, 6% of the, the students on free and reduced lunch were white, 12 out of 200 um, had specific learning disabilities. There's a risk difference of 6 points and a uh, black-white risk ratio of 2.0. And I did the same thing looking at non-poor uh, and doing that comparison. So 
again, sometimes there can be a tendency to to just look at um, the best news. And and you might say, among the poor, the black-white risk ratio was just 2.0. And um, so that was lower than the overall district. And in addition, there were more poor blacks than poor whites. So, so probably poverty is contributing uh, to the degree of racial disparity in specific learning disabilities. And while that is true, these things are also true. The poverty does not explain these racial disparities, really not even close. And so one of the ways you can look at this is that the non-poor blacks had almost the same risk as the poor blacks. So you would have expected to see a much larger difference. Um, there was a large difference in risk between non-poor and poor whites. The non-poor blacks were almost three times as likely to be, the non-poor to be labeled as having a specific learning disability as the non-poor whites. So when you remove poverty, the risk ratio and the risk gap went up. And the racial disparities were still quite large among the poor. 2.0 is not the same as non-existent. So, and it's also true that the non-poor blacks were nearly twice as likely to be identified as having specific learning disabilities as the poor whites. So this often, this kind of analysis, now I don't know how it will come out. Every district is different, and you might find, uh, you know, a stronger argument that poverty is contributing. But it's important that you can get at this data to unpack it, because I find invariably it doesn't come nearly close enough to explain the degree of racial disparity, and it's sort of helps put that issue to one side. And oftentimes, I will get that data ahead of time and do this. And then, you know, whether or not I walk through all the calculations with the district depends on, on how much time I want to spend on it. Um, so this sort of uh, brings us to wrapping up uh, my presentation today. It's really important that, in general, that as you use this checklist, you're using it to encourage the reduction and prevention of inappropriate identification, inappropriate placement, uh, inappropriate uh, uh, discipline rates. Um, and that thing about prevention really thinks about regular and special education together. That real problem solving is going to happen when we can reject the status quo, get at some of the root causes of the racial disparities, you know, acknowledge that. There may be racial bias as one of the many factors that's contributing to the, the, the tendencies and trends that you observe, and actively discuss their racial data with their staff. And that's how we get, you know, hopefully districts to start thinking beyond merely compliance um, and, and beyond merely analyzing those specific areas that the district was identified for. So you want to help them form a hypothesis that's informed by the data, develop remedies um, that are, are dri that you know are further informed by the data. So part, part of this is they may develop several hypotheses, but the data support some more than others. And then once the interventions happen, hopefully they would invite you back, or that you could help them set up a template to reevaluate the remedies as they go. So they're continually, continually, continuously looking at their data and multiple data sources in both general and special education uh, as they go. So if you have further questions, um, you know, you can contact me directly. I also do uh, this work consulting with districts. So if the district wanted to bring uh, me in just to do some data analysis, if they have the available data, I could do that. Um, and um, so that ends uh, the presentation for today. I hope you find, found it useful. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, everyone, for participating today. Uh, please remember that you will have an opportunity either through the um, follow-up evaluation to provide some more questions for Mr. Lawson, and also we have the teleconference that's scheduled for March 8th, that's a Tuesday, at 10 a.m., and so you'll have more opportunity again for conversation and for questions as well. And uh, Daniel, there are some questions in the chat right now, so I don't know if you want to take a few minutes to go ahead and respond. Uh, yes, uh, let's see. Um... I'm not sure I understand uh, Guillermo's question. So is it possible to, to present this tool in other presentations? I mean, the you, I think if you're asking can you combine tools, I would think you could. Um, and that is the main question that I see. Mm -hmm. 
So, but um, if, if Guillermo, if you want to talk further, you can call me or we can, um, you know, in the follow-up session, we can, you can have, uh, there are additional questions that you'd like me to answer, I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah, and I can remind everyone that the follow-up session will be just on the, using the telephone, uh, not, not the webinar. So there will definitely be opportunity for some back-and-forth dialogue. And I'd also, I'd be curious to let folks try the, go to the implicit um, website and try that out, whether they think that would be useful in their work with districts. I don't do that with every single district, but I, I'm thinking that it is important. And I, certainly I raise that issue in every district, but I don't always uh, have you know, ask the staff or, or administrators to, to use the tool. Okay. Great. Well, again, thank you very much, Daniel, and thank everyone for participating. Thank you. Bye.